And Jesus himself said that he did not come to do away with the law. This is the Adventist Pilgrimage Podcast with your hosts, Michael Campbell and Greg Howell. Welcome to the Adventist Pilgrimage Podcast. I'm Michael Campbell, your host, and my good co-host friend, Greg Howell, is off on a mission trip in Africa, so I'm wishing him well. But all the same, while he's away, I have my very good friend, Christy Chow, who is uh, the author of a new book that I am just uh, been delighted to read Schism, Seventh-day Adventism in Post-Denominational China. Christy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me in this project. Yes, and I'm just uh, really uh, excited about uh, both your book, but also some of the, the great work you've been doing. We've been friends going to professional meetings over the years and collaborating on different kinds of things. And, you know, for those of our listeners who may not be familiar with your work, could you tell us just a little bit about yourself? I mean, we've been friends for a long time, so I know you, but uh, I know our listeners want to get to know you just a little bit. So if you could just share um, a little bit of your background uh, and interest uh, that led to this project. I was born in Hong Kong and uh, I identified myself as a Chinese, but also um a Hong Konger, which is a new term um, given the new development in the Hong Kong society. So I'm kind of, um, front, I consider myself as a frontier crossing person because of my um, Hong Kong background. So I received um, most of my education uh, in colonial Hong Kong. And uh, I went to uh, Baptist University to receive my undergrad degree in communication. And then I spent some years uh, in journalism. And then I moved to working in the church organization, first um, for the Hong Kong Macau Conference, and then moved to work in uh, the Chinese Union Mission. And in both these church organizations, uh, I was um, responsible for editing uh, the church papers. Um, and then after working for the Chinese Union Mission for uh, Quite some years, I decided to um, go for some theological training. And so I traveled to the UK and then I settled in uh, the University of St. Andrews and did my undergrad, um, I mean, the, um, the graduate degree. Even though uh, the degree that I obtained from uh, St. Andrews is uh, a Bachelor of Divinity. But people tell me that, um, that degree corresponds to the American uh, theological education, which is an MD. I don't right, know much right. about that. I, I think okay. you're right. And, and I was going to say, I think you went to the, the real Andrews University. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I get confused at conferences all the time. So how was Scotland? And <laughs> Yeah. And so, I mean, the education that I received in St. Andrews really shaped my theological understanding of Adventism and also uh, Christianity. Um. And then I moved back to Hong Kong and then worked for a, a very short time in the Hong Kong Adventist College. And then I met my husband and then I moved to the uh, United States. And then in America, I was very privileged to have a full scholarship from Princeton Theological Seminary. And so I have my uh, doctorate training in, at Princeton for six years. And then so the book uh, originates from my doctoral thesis. So that is much of my education background. And so the reason Adventism is such an interesting topic uh, to me, I think first, first of all, because I am an Adventist and uh, this religious movement all, always intrigues me. Uh, part of the reason is because um, Adventism in Hong Kong is remains to be a minority faith. The size of the church is small, but then they have a huge a quite comprehensive ministry uh, in the areas of uh, education and uh, health care. And also, Hong Kong is a, a small place, but we have more than 20 uh, chapels and churches to accommodate different uh, needs of uh, um, the different cluster of religion in Hong Kong. And so I'm always trying to think out how this minority faith uh, grows but then when I began to work 
um, in the Chinese Union mission. That institution took me to a new direction to understand how Adventism, this movement, is going on in mainland China, a bigger continent that in comparison of the small city of Hong Kong. And so the first time I visit the Adventist church in China is during the 1990s, after the pro-democracy movement um, in China, which uh, was suppressed. And uh, so the constant narrative I heard um, in Hong Kong is that, oh, China, there is no religious freedom and the Christian believers were very much suppressed by a very authoritarian state. But my first visit to the Adventist church gave me a, an alternative perspective. I went to Kunming, uh, a very big church, and I experienced a very vibrant uh, Sabbath worship. And then the church leader took the delegate to visit some minority church, ethnic minority church, which was also this, which displays also a very vibrant religious life. So I, I began to think that, okay, there is a narrative talking about the Chinese Adventist church, but on the ground, people will have a different experience. And I took that experience um, in my doctoral study, and I began to think that, okay, how do one reconcile these two narratives? Um, how do we understand we have suppression and repression but then how do the Christians live out their life on the ground in a grassroots level? And so I decided to do field work for my doctoral uh, thesis and um, the product is my book. Interesting. Well, I love, I love your book. I mean, I, I love going through it the first time when I read some of the manuscript and then more recently in preparing for uh, this, this podcast, I went back through, uh, <laughs> through the book and enjoyed it even more um, through the whole thing. Uh, and, and, you know, as, as you've gone through your experience, you know, both personally and your experience with Adventism, uh, but then also academically, you know, and here you are beginning to kind of dive a bit deeper. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned going actually over to mainland China from Hong Kong and some of your own experiences. H how did you settle on one when Joe, I'm, I'm not even probably saying that quite right, but, um, but here you actually do this case study of all the different places you could have picked, um, how did you end up focusing on Wenzhou? Um, of mm. Just kind of curious. Yeah, I think your pronunciation is great. So it's Wenzhou. Oh, okay. I didn't. I think at this point, I have to thank the Chinese Union Mission because of my previous uh, working relationship uh, with the union. I was able to uh, have the field director to introduce me some of the contacts in Wenzhou. And so that um, I had a very little uh, obstacles in accessing the field. Um, and then when I settled in Wanzhou, uh, I first contact. You see, the, the challenge of, of researching all these different clusters of Adventists is that you have to win trust from them. And I think my Hong Kong identity works very well because I am not, for them, I'm a Chinese. I speak uh, the Mandarin, even though uh, I don't speak the, the local dialect. But then because they know that, okay, you are part of us, right? You are an Adventist. And then I think I am the first historian getting into the field to, to show an interest to their own history. And it fascinates them at, uh, um, very much. And so when they knew that, okay, I was from Hong Kong, coming, uh, having a U.S. education background and some work experience with the church organization, all these identities um, helped me very much to uh to win their trust um and then when i was in the field i was constantly reminded that okay when you encountered any group's leader the so-called factional leader your road is to just listen to them don't comment okay because that will give them a hard feelings to thinking that are you with us or against us so this kind of field experience and field wisdom i learned it from the field so that, to mm -hmm. maintain that neutrality, if I'm hearing you right. Yes, very much. Yeah. And and then, you know, having, you know, traveled a little bit and having worked in, in the Philippines at the seminary there, IS, um, 
I mean, I, I knew a little bit uh, before reading your book, but, you know, like, for example, I know there's the kind of the traditional Adventists, and then there's the wilderness Adventists that seem to be pretty prevalent. And then you have these kind of other variations, but you're listening, if I'm hearing you right, and and, and, and understanding your, your thesis, but you're listening. Um, and, and then you kind of identify these four groups. Uh, and I don't want to kind of steal this the whole thesis away because I want our listeners, you know, if you're really um, interested in doing a deep dive, you want to check out Christie's book, uh, which is, again, it's titled Schism, Seventh-day Adventism in Post-Denominational China, published by uh, the University of Notre Dame Press. So uh, that's that's a, a pretty substantial, uh, a major academic press. So that's, that's pretty significant. Um, I just want a, a shout out. Uh, to get an Adventist historian publishing quality scholarship with a major university press. So um, I, I, I think we need more of that. And I've seen like Gil Valentine and others have, you know, said, hey, this is a model of the kind of work and historiography that we need to see in, in, in many different places around the world to better understand global Adventism. But here you come up with these four uh, different uh, groups or schisms or whatever or factions, I guess sometimes is another term that you use. Um, uh, the so you have the 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 kind of the traditional or conservative. Um, you have the new faction. You have the wilderness faction. You have the wheat field that you describe. Um, do you see? I mean, you've traveled obviously many different places in China. Um, obviously, I guess that list could be even further subdivided in other parts of China. But here's the four that you have. Uh, for Wang Zhou, uh, and 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 I'm kind of curious how you're listening to these people, and then you kind of say, oh, well, it's it's pretty. Was it pretty obvious to see these four different groups? And and can you kind of just give us a recap, just very briefly, of of these four groups? I I think our listeners would find that interesting. Yeah. So thank you for the question. So the four groups that um um the Ah, let me think about how to respond to this question. So the four group, the reformists, the conservatives, uh, the wilderness, and the Whitfield ministry. And I think when I consider them as four groups, I always think that even though they self-identify themselves having an internal boundaries in the denomination, but on the whole, they consider themselves as part of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. And uh, in my book, I describe how the division um, happens in different periods of time. So the first division I identified happened in the late uh, 1970s between the reformists and the conservatives. And then in late 80s through uh, the 90s, you have another subgroup dividing from the conservatives and self-identify themselves as the wilderness and then the Whitfield Ministry is a current uh, uh, factional um, um, cluster, which uh, separate themselves from the reformist. And uh, so in my book, I try to understand not just their theological disagreements, but I'd also locate their disagreements in the larger context. Why were they doing this? What were they trying to respond? Was it something to do with the new religious policy that kept changing and kept asking, requiring them to reflect on their identity as opposed to the Sunday churches? And then um, how are they going to adapt themselves to a changing religious environment when during the 90s, China experienced a relatively uh, more liberal, uh, free atmosphere and people were trying to um, tap into the religious market and uh, make draw new converts to their own uh, faith tradition. So I think Gibber Valentine's uh, review did a very great job in saying that this is a new model or a new way of to look at this religious movement that in the past, when we talk about Adventism around the world, it focused very much on the mission history. And then it talks very little about the native agency and how they live out their life in their own context. And then 
and I think what I try to do is let's look at how the indigenous Adventists respond to the context and how they use Adventist resources to think about their own religious identity. And the story of the Chinese Adventist schism is, okay, in this process, they have different ways of thinking and they have different ways of understanding traditional Adventist resources. And when they display their faith expression, you have a different cluster of Adventists. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I just find this utterly fascinating. And I, I hope that there are people that listen to this podcast, maybe aspiring historians or people that are off uh, to grad school, maybe even looking for a topic that, that this could be a role model. We, we need similar kinds of uh, studies done of Adventism in Africa, Af- Adventism in Latin America, where uh, in Asia. And if you take those three regions of the world, you've got what, probably 85% of the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist church, huge percentages of our world, uh, worldwide um, Adventist denomination, and yet uh, so much historiography, so much work that's just waiting uh, for people to delve into and do a much deeper dive. And I, so I just want to, again, a shout out of appreciation, but also a little bit of, of inspiration. I hope that we're going to see more people uh, doing similar kinds of things. We we desperately need that kind of global uh, perspective of Adventism. I think it'll really enrich our historiography moving forward. Anyway, that's a, a little a tangent. That's my little that's my little sermon. <laughs> that's the pastor me coming out. I, I hope we could see more. We need more of this. Uh, uh, you know, the other thing I was a really important takeaway, and, and some Adventists may struggle with this, is the title of your book, Schism. Right. Mm. Um, because right away, it's like, uh, is, is, is that what um, is that what Christie wants? No. It, it, and, and you actually define right at the beginning. Schism is not inherently necessarily a bad thing. It's not a bad word. Right. And so this notion of schism um, shows that people really care about what they believe, if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, Christy. So t- walk us a little bit about you know, why that matters. Um, so much. Yeah, so a quick question, right? The conceptual framework of schism. And when I, the original title for my doctoral dissertation doesn't have that term because I was thinking that, okay, that is a provocative term. But then I thank for, I have to thank my um, advisor, uh, Professor Richard Young uh, of the uh, Princeton Theological Seminary. He actually introduced me to the great, the large literature of church division. And I stumbled into a book, um, I forgot, oh, maybe Matthew has to uh, take this out, but um, I stumbled on that term, okay, schism. And I struggled with that a lot because of all the literature that I read that discussed church division, it tends to view it as a very bad way. But when I look at the sociological literature, that gave me a new perspective, meaning that, okay, even though religious movement or any kind of movement, they have a process at, um, to survive. And division is one way for the movement to remain healthy, organic, um, because if it doesn't change, then the movement will die very soon. And I think that happened to Adventism in America as well, right? It is a very vibrant faith, even though we kind of resist to define a religious movement in schismatic terms, because we think that schism is bad. But think about if division can breed new understanding of the faith, and then that attracts people to form new groups, right? That is a, one way of looking at it, and that is that is the, that evangelistic, organic, moving forward kind of orientation that makes a religious movement dynamic. Yeah, I, I like that. If I'm hearing you, you know, like even creativity, right? And this sense of innovation that uh, that that any entity has to have to survive, um, and it, it kind of 
segueing just a little bit, but you know, another thought that I had is one of the other things I really love about your book is you're engaged with the wider world of scholarship. And I think you had to do this being at, at Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, and, you know, you're talking there reminds me of warm memories growing up, <laughs> going to Spear Memorial Library, right? And and so you have such, such a, a great, rich environment with all of this wider literature. And I noticed how and this isn't my my field, but I, I I'm interested certainly. Uh, but here you are, you know, referencing you know a lot of the wider scholars that you've been talking about, Daniel Bayes. I mean, you could go on mm-hmm. through a long list. Um, but one of the things I really appreciate, and I think, is probably a lacuna in Adventist historiography overall, is the lack of engagement with wider historiography, the wider scholarship going on, uh, and and yet you do that so superbly, you know. Um, and, and, and I also noticed, and, and you have to help me out, Christy, because I, I hope I understand this correctly, but um, one of the things that's been, if, I, if I'm reading some of the literature right outside of Adventism, is this whole idea of denomination. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of scholars have been kind of really hard on this notion of denomination um, and that denominations, and of course, the Chinese, the communist government has been uh, with the three self movement and everything else has been trying to push. And yet here you have Adventists that have not only survived, but perhaps I would even say thrived. They've grown over the last 50, 60, 70 years, maybe not always easily. And certainly they've subdivided and everything else. But the one of my takeaways and help me out with this um, is that denominations actually have value here in the story of Adventism in China, the, this whole notion of denomination. I, am I right? It, help me with that a little bit. Yes, I think your observation is right. And I think your reading of my uh, major argument in the book is really, really right. And I think take the book takes a denominational perspective, which is which I'm pretty open in my introduction that because I want to be explicit in in the way I tell the story, that I am taking a denominational perspective, okay? I am an Adventist, but I examine Adventism in China from a scholarly perspective. And I want to emphasize their denominational characteristics because, first of all, this knowledge is informed by from the field, okay? My informant, the people that I was investigating, told me so, okay? So I am I am trying to be true to their story, okay? I'm not trying to use a model to impose on their story and then come up with a new interpretation. That is not what I want to do. I want to be true to their voices. That is the first point. And I think secondly, I think Russell Richard's studies on the American denominations helped me to to have this theorization that if you take a denominational perspective, you will be able to interpret why they think this way and why they act this way. That is the second point, right? The, the, I'm standing on the, the shoulder of the past scholarship. That is quite informative to me. And I think the third point I want to tell in the book is because the Chinese church on the whole doesn't want to recognize denominational characteristics. And I think there is another story behind it, which is, no, no, the Christian believers don't agree with that. And Adventists are among those groups. I think in China, not only the Adventists have a very denominational characteristics, there are other groups, like for, for instance, the Christian assembly. They have a very clear way of doing worship and living their Christian life in a very particular way that you can tell the difference between this particular group as opposed to a larger Sunday Protestant uh, group. And although the Christian assembly also worship on Sunday, but they have a unique way of living their Christian life. And I think bringing these diversity out in a scholarly work can tell a different story, which is all these denominational groups are contributing to diversify the Chinese church. And I think that, that that is a very important perspective because the Chinese church is not a monolithic entity. It is wrong to see that it is a it is a 
just one church, one way of worshiping God, and one way of living your Christian life. That kind of narrative has to be has to be critique, I think. Yeah, yeah, and you know, the, it, it highlights, I think, the importance. Uh, and I like that that narrative and, and the importance of denominations, but but they're all. It, and your book highlights, you know, there was some tension because Adventists were doing missionary work, but not playing by the rules of everybody else. Of let's divide different areas, and you go evangelize this region, and we'll evangelize this other region. Going back to I think the 1910 Edinburgh Conference, um, so Adventists were perceived as kind of were sheep stealers. But but also those lines between denominations could be somewhat porous. And I, mm-hmm. you know, the one area I don't think, and this is not a reflection on your book, but I'm just thinking more broadly in terms of historiography. We haven't always done a good job at looking at how those, because some of those missionaries and some of those early converts went back to other denominations too. So there was some there is some fluidity or porousness in those lines between denomination. If if I if you know, I, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, so, so coming back to your book though, um, there might be somebody listening and says, you know what, I really love this. Uh, my dream is to write a similar work on Adventism in a different part of the world or whatever. Um, tell us a little bit about what drives you. Obviously you have your own experience. Um, and, and if, if a young scholar came up to you, Christy, and said, you know, I, I need some advice. What, what advice would you have for them? for an aspiring uh, individual who would like to pursue uh, a a similar kind of trajectory? Yeah, good question. And I think I am also asking myself the same set of questions. What what am I going to do if I want to write a second book, okay, using a similar methodology? um, um, Yeah, good question. I think, first of all, I would advise my advice is, if you are going to look at the believers, how they live out their religious life, you have to be empathetic. Most of the time in scholarly training, we are trained to be critical. We are trained to, to be neutral. We are trained to be objective. But I think what is helpful for me is, okay, all these objectivity, uh, neutrality are important. But then first of all, open your heart and your mind and your ears to listen to how people talked about their Christian experience. That is very important. That means you have to take an empathetic perspective. Okay. And I think secondly, um, Adventist scholar to study Adventism is very challenging because most of the time we tend to Defend our faith, faith, right? Our our own faith tradition comes in. By the way, you're talking about being empathetic, and I I don't think my wife, who is in a graduate program, as you know, um, when whenever uh, your name is mentioned, um, we we always a word of appreciation, to Christy, how you're one of the most encouraging scholars that that has really encouraged her, and so I, I think you do have the gift of encouragement and. I, I appreciate that because as academics, um, there's a like you said a tendency to be critical, uh, and and that's good. We need to hold each other to the highest standards, but we need to do it in a way uh, that personifies uh, not not only excellence but also that aspect of integrity and also a sense of kindness and encouragement. So I just want to thank you on a personal note for being so encouraging uh, oh. in the work that you do. <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, I remember I, I, what I what I wanted to say. I think the word suspension is important as an Adventist scholar to study Adventism. I mean, first of all, you have to okay suspend your own judgment or for a moment, and then to open your ears to listen, and then not until you understand what people are saying, then you can step back or step forward and then try to analyze. Yeah, I think that that is still in my mind. Um, What else? Uh, Oh, and then also the language. I mean, Michael, you have written great articles on the the Adventist um, missionaries uh, in China, which is really great. Um, But I mean, if 
anyone want to do a contemporary investigation on the Adventist movement? And if you are working in an area where you don't speak the language, then I think, first of all, you have to learn the language um, this is to do with challenge. the sources. <laughs> yeah. Well, but then your, your biography is really helpful. And I was, I'm always thinking that, okay, if one day I'm moving backward to work on the mission history, then Michael will be my teacher. And the work you've done is re- really helpful. Well, and I think this shows that how collaboration in scholarship is really good on, on both sides, where people can bring both of their strengths uh, and be able to say, hey, here's the material I found. What's the material you found? Uh, and another good example of this is Timothy Tay, who's one of the first mm. indigenous converts who you know, whose story is not well known. And I and here, you know, I'm finding stuff. And then I'm writing my students in Malaysia and Indonesia saying, hey, what materials do you have that are in Malaysian and Indonesian? Because, you know, Christy, let's face it, I'm at the point in my life where I'm not going to learn, you know, half a dozen new languages. Which is, as much as I would like to do that, you know, but to have people, and I think that shows again that collaboration uh, and finding new things. And, and somehow we've got to do a better job at telling the stories, not just of the missionaries, but also of the converts. And I'm putting a little shameless plug out there, but we also haven't done a very good job at telling the stories of women in terms of gender. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, and, and this is not meant to be a criticism, but, you know, I, you know, I've written to even the Encyclopedia Project. Why isn't there an article in Timothy Tay? Why isn't there articles on a bunch of these early Adventist women? And so, well, we're busy. We're so busy trying to get the articles we already have. We don't have time for new stuff, you know, to add to that. But somehow we, we still need to do a better job at, in our historiography to be more inclusive of these stories. Yeah. I cannot agree more. I think um, it is, I think most of the time when we think about the Adventist historiography, it's very mission history oriented. And uh, But I'm so glad that there is a new generation of scholars, including you, right? Trying. To have, yeah, and to to be attentive to, okay, there are other aspects, there are other methodology that, that can help us to better understand this Greek religious movement. Um, I'm so glad that um, the way that I, 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 write, I wrote my book um, can be something helpful for the next generation or next generation, the younger generation, the new scholars. Yeah, I hope so. And I, I can't wait to see you know, creative new directions where people will come in the future and to build upon and, and, and collaborate, collaboration and synergy. Uh, so I have to ask, you know, and of course, some of our listeners may be aware, maybe not, you know, obviously you and I are working uh, on the Oxford Handbook of Seventh-day Adventism with, with Dennis Kaiser and Nick mm-hmm. Miller and uh, David Holland. We've got a great editorial team. So that's, that's been a fun project. It's really close to being done. <laughs> so close. Uh, and uh, so I'm excited that's going to be coming out. But, but beyond that, uh, tell me, Christy, uh, have you thought about what next? Good question. So recently, I am working on an article on the Chinese reception of LNG White. I don't know how far that article. Um, I I mean, I'm still working on that, but um, it's fascinating because China is such a big field, and there are different reception of LNG White's writings and interesting to see how people use her and then misinterpret her and then or interpret her in their own ways and all these were done without um, knowing that there is a new scholarship or new studies on mg white right in america at least in andrews university or you 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 have known of that okay this woman, Victorian woman, her writing and her life, you have to historicize her, okay, so that you won't misinterpret her or you won't misunder- misunderstand her. But then all this training is, is quite very lacking in the Chinese church. So you can see that it's quite primitive to approach Ellen White. So I'm trying to figure out, okay, without all these tools, how do people read her? How do people use her? Almost it's, like a reception history kind of thing. Yes, yeah. And then another project that I'm trying to work on is how 
in in today's China, when the Adventists are not allowed to have hospital and healthcare system, how do they continue their health practice in the church setting? And how do they use those health teachings to make new converts or contribute to a society where health insurance and healthcare network is very lacking? That is another project that I'm having in mind. Well, those sound like uh, fun research projects, and that will that will build on some of your existing work. You know, I noticed in the in your book Schism that you know one of the major themes is Ellen White. You know, who, mm-hmm. who claims to properly understand and interpret and even translate. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking of another communist country, not China, but another one where they just blatantly translated the book and rewrote whole vast sections of Steps to Christ. Uh, to make her actually sound like a communist to get that kind of approval. <laughs> and I'm not going to say where this is because I don't, you know, but but it's another communist country. And uh, so this is a struggle, right? Because yeah. those who translate, um, if if other people don't have access to the original language, they're kind of dependent on those translations. So depending mm-hmm. on how accurate they are, so many aspects um, that relate to power and authority and that could be explored. So I'm excited about where you're mm-hmm. going to go in the future. If they want to get the book, um, what, Amazon? Amazon and the Notre Dame University Press website. Um, there is a, a discount uh, running, oh, until December 31st, but uh, it's a few days away. So I just hope that, I'm hoping that, okay, it's a hardback bo- uh, work, uh, but uh, some days uh, in the future, there will be a paperback and it will reduce the price of the book. It's quite pricey, I think. It is. I was glad for that discount. <laughs> and I'll, uh, I'll, we'll put a link to, in the show notes so that if, if those who are listening would like to, they can easily find uh, Christy's book. So, Christy, mm-hmm. thanks, thanks so much for joining um, the Adventist Pilgrimage Podcast. Uh, again, I'm your host, Michael Campbell, and we've been interviewing Christy Chow about her new book, uh, Schism, that takes a deep dive. Uh, the subtitle is Seventh-day Adventism and Post-Denominational China. Christy, thanks for your work. Thanks for listening uh, to our podcast. And uh, we'll have another uh, episode as we do a deep dive each month into Adventist historiography. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. And Jesus himself said that he did not come to do away with the law. out of this world if he does not want us to be contaminated by it. The Adventist Pilgrimage Podcast is part of the Adventist History Podcast Network. You can find other podcasts as well as additional content from this podcast by following us on YouTube and Facebook. If you'd like to support this show or others on the Adventist History Podcast Network, please visit patreon.com slash Adventist History Podcast. Enjoy the show.